Amen. Y'all stand up. All right, put your hands together. Unless you're holding your coffee, now put it down.
we call on you today to join us in, in our uh, praise and worship today. Father, we thank you that you are here and in the midst of us. We love you. We thank you for your great love for us. Thank you for each person who's come out today. God, everything that's said and done and sung up here, God, I pray will give you honor and glory. Thank you for being with us this morning. For anybody who's new, my name is Ashley Reddick, and I'm worship leader here at the Crossroads Service. We have Patrick and Janet, part of our worship team this morning. And uh, this is the first time I think uh, I've even let Patrick do something. Usually the microphone's turned off, so she turned it on this morning. So, yeah, if if all of a sudden he goes away, I, you know. <laughs> no, but there's talents all over this church. And maybe it's not up here doing this kind of thing, but you need to find what it is God's given you to do and use it because we can use so many people in every area. And uh, I'm just proud that these guys want to be up here and do this. And I love worshiping with you all and with them. And we're going to do that some more this morning. breaks the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. son and daughter, the king of glory, the king of glory. Who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of its brilliance, the king of glory, the king above all kings. This is amazing grace, this is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross. you would 
God doesn't need us to tell him that he's worthy. It's for us. We gotta remind ourselves daily of what he's done for us. It's easy just to go through life and think, oh, it's just another day. It's not just another day. If you're a child of God, it is a new day. There are blessings and, and promises given to us consistently. And we have to remember and we have to remind ourselves. So through the day, we need to sing, worthy is he. Worthy is the lamb who was slain because he was slain for me and for you. Oh, it's good. Let's sing that part again. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. He conquered the grave. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. big stuff right there. There is nothing that can compare to what he has done for us. And because he did that, we don't have to carry around all that junk that I like to tote. <clears throat> I like just to carry it around and keep it with me and, oh yeah, but this, oh yeah, but that. You know what? God says, my grace is sufficient. You don't need, you don't need all that stuff. Lay it down, let it go. Your chains have broken off if you'll let them. What do you got to let go of today? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. i 
May be seated. Amazing grace. Are your chains gone today? If they're not gone today, they can be. Amen. Today we're going to continue to worship God with our tithes and offerings. As our ushers come, I just want to share one verse from Psalm 116 today. And you may have gotten a letter from our pastor. This is Stewardship Sunday, and this verse was on that letter this week. And it's verse 12. What can I offer the Lord for all he has done for me? And that's really a good question, isn't it? How could we ever repay our Lord and Savior for that amazing grace that he gave us on the cross of Calvary 2,000 years ago? We really can't, can we? But we can be obedient, and we can return the tithe, and we can bring offerings. Today, I bring an offering to God because God laid that upon my heart. My tithe will come after Tuesday. I get paid on Tuesday. That's payday. Amen. Anybody else in here like payday? That's a good day. But that's one of the first checks I will write will be my tithe check Tuesday. But this is an offering. And today we're going to pledge at the end of the service for future offerings that we can bring throughout 20, the rest of 2017 into 2018. So just be obedient. Thank you so much because you are obedient. You're a very generous and giving church. Let's pray for our offering. Father God, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for an opportunity to continue to worship you, not only with great praise and worship music, and not only with the teaching of your word in a few moments, but right now through our giving. And I just pray for obedience for each and every one of us, for our hearts to bring those offerings that you impress upon us and to bring the full tithe in obedience to you, to return that to you for your church. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
good morning. Thank you for being here on this beautiful Sunday morning. You know, I believe that East Tennessee has skipped autumn and gone straight to winter. And if you're new here to East Tennessee, welcome to East Tennessee. You'll have your air conditioners back on again in November, no doubt, before we finish the year out and we'll probably see some snow. But thank you for being here today. If you're a first-time guest, do me a favor. Take this out of your bulletin. Fill that out. Bring that to me at the end of the service. I would love to meet you and just say thank you for being our guest today. We promise we won't abuse your information whatsoever. Uh, I'll probably send you a letter, an email, something like that, just to say thank you and let you know that we're here and we are so glad that you came to check us out at Severable First United Methodist Church. Well, did Brother Jim Goddard take care of y'all the last two weeks? I pray that he did. I have not preached in about a month. I have been at local pastor training. I have been on vacation. So you guys may get a dose today of me. It may be an hour, hour and a half, maybe two hours. Can we do that? Is everybody ready for some good old-fashioned preaching? Are you ready for that? I'm hearing some people. Some people are looking for the exits right now. I'm just teasing. If you got your notes, if you don't have your teaching notes, uh, we got those in the back. If you raise your hand, an usher might could help you with those. I got three points today. I, I kept it short on purpose because I knew this was going to be a challenge. And today we're talking about extravagant generosity. We're finishing out our stewardship month here at Severeville First, and it's the heart of giving. But before I get started on that, I've got something that I've got a little bit of a burden on. I just want you guys to. Uh, carry this burden with me. Right now, do you see any problems in America? Do we, <laughs> that's funny, isn't it? Do you have any issues in America where it seems like we're divided, where we can't get along, where you've got the independents, the Democrats, the Republicans, you've got Fox News, you've got CNN, you've got Facebook, you've got social media, you've got stuff going on, right? I want you all to do something with me. Will you join with me in prayer? And I'm praying for revival. I'm praying not for the Democrats, I'm not praying for the Republicans, I'm praying for the church. The bride of the living God, of Jesus Christ, to stand up and be the church. And if the church will be the church, we can take care of a whole lot of junk in America, can't we? We can go out and we can help people. And if we have a revival and if people will have a burden for the bride of Christ to come in here, to be a part of this, to help us transform the world, to be an impact on society instead of society impacting us. What kind of difference can we make in America? So I just want you to do that. If you will agree to pray with me for revival, and let it start right here. Let it start in us. Pray that it starts in me first, and then it spreads out. I just pray that you guys will do that. Would you raise your hand if you'll do that? If you'll just agree to pray with me for revival. Amen. That's what we're wanting, and that's what we're looking forward to. And you know, I can't bring revival. You can't bring revival. The Holy Spirit is going to have to stir up revival in each and every one of us and start in our hearts. Amen. Amen. Today, we give was our, our transition video, and we're not really giving as much as we're deciding in a stewardship pledge what we might give, what God may lay up on our hearts. And we're going to deal with that at the end of the service. You've got a pen, you've got an envelope, and you've got this card in every other seat. If you need more, there's some up here on the table as well. But we're going to look at that. And we're going to talk about some things today. We're going to talk about the stuff that we have in America. I talked about that in the first sermon that we had in this series. If you missed that, you can go back earlier this month on our webpage or on Facebook, and you can catch up and you can see some of that. I talked about how much storage we had in America. It's not just enough that we have what we have in our homes. We're now building more and more self-storage to go out and store more things so that we can accumulate more stuff in our house. And I'm not putting down self-storage. You're, you're brilliant if you're a business person and you go out and you, and you build those right now today because uh, that's, that's what we're doing in America. It's billions and billions of dollars and taking up many, many acres. Just look around your neighborhood if you've never noticed them as you drive home today and count how many self-storage facilities that you'll see. But that tells us something about our hearts. It tells us about who we are as Americans, who we are as Christians. And uh, we want to change that. We want to be more generous. And this is a generous church. I'm not preaching down saying that you're not. This is a very generous church. But we can all do a little bit better. And, and talking about our things and our stuff, it reminds me of a story that I heard recently. And my son told me I ought to do three of those stories since I haven't been with you all in the last three weeks. But I'm not going to do that to you. I, I decided I didn't want to run everybody out of here. This is not theologically correct, however, when you hear the story. There once was a rich man who was near death. He was very grieved because he had worked so hard for his money, and he wanted to be able to take it with him to heaven. So he began to pray that he might be able to take some of his wealth with him. 
And the angel hears his plea and appeal appears to him and says, Sorry, but you can't take your wealth with you. The man implores the angel to speak to God to see if he might bend the rules. The man continues to pray about this, that his wealth could follow him. The angel reappears and informs the man that God has decided to allow him to take one suitcase with him. Overjoyed, the man gathers his largest suitcase and fills it with pure gold bars and places it beside his bed. Soon afterward, the man dies and shows up at the gates of heaven to greet St. Peter. And St. Peter, seeing the suitcase, says, hold on, you can't bring that in here. But the man explains to St. Peter. He has permission and asks him to verify his story with the Lord. Sure enough, St. Peter checks and comes back saying, You're right. You are allowed one carry-on bag, but I'm supposed to check its contents before letting it through. St. Peter opens the suitcase to inspect the worldly items that the man found too precious to leave behind and exclaims, You brought pavement? (laughs) Some of y'all explain that to the others on the way home today. Streets of gold, pavement enough of that foolishness. Let's jump into the Word of God today. Let's look at Matthew chapter 6 verses 19 through 21 and we're going to talk about what Jesus tells us about generosity, about how we should see our stuff here on earth. And Jesus' words, he says, don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moss and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be. So wherever your treasure is, where is your treasure today? Think about that. Where is your treasure? What's your most treasured possession or possessions? That's where your heart's going to be. That's where you're going to follow. If you put in a, a... million dollars into the stock market, which I don't have that problem, I don't have a million dollars, but if you did have that issue and you put a million dollars into a certain stock, you're going to follow that stock, aren't you? You're going to know if it's up, you're going to know if it's down. You're going to be following and keeping an eye on that stock market to see what that stock is doing. Well, this is the same principle. Wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And your first point today, Christian, we should be concerned, more concerned with storing treasure in heaven than here on earth. Where is your treasure? I just want you to think about that today as we're in the stewardship campaign, as we're finishing this Sunday. And I know that salvation is not by works. We're saved by grace, not by works. And that that's not going to get us to heaven. But it can make a difference what we do here on what's awaiting us on the other side in eternity. And if we send that treasure on ahead to heaven, then our heart will be on ahead in heaven. And that's a pretty good place for our focus to be, to be on kingdom-minded things versus stuff and earthly things. But generosity is more than just writing a check. It's more than putting some money in an offering plate. God wants more from us than a financial gift. He wants all of us. If he gets all of us, he'll get our wallets. He'll get our finances as well. So if we're totally sold out and devoted followers of Jesus Christ, and I pray that we're all disciples of Jesus Christ in here, that we're all followers, that we've not just maybe made a head decision, you know, maybe we prayed a prayer at one time, maybe we even got baptized, but I pray that you've surrendered your life, will, and your emotions to Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and if you haven't done that, today could be that day of salvation. That's the most important decision that we can make in this life, more so than any financial decision or where treasures are going to be. We need to make sure of that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. God gives us everything that we have anyway. And if he's got all of us, he'll have everything that we have. Our finances will come with the rest of us. But I have to admit, sometimes I have to think, I have to check myself. Where is my treasure? My children, my family. I love my children. I love my family. I love this church. I love ministry. I love what God has called me and created me to do. And I can never let those things get out of the right position. I've got to keep them in the right priority and understand that my relationship with Christ and what he wants me to do should always be first, that my things shouldn't have me, that I should be able to use those things. There's nothing wrong with things. There's nothing wrong with wealth. We can use it to do what God has called us and created us to do. So we've got works and we've got faith. Faith is through, that's how we get saved is through faith in Christ. But where do our works fit in? What are we going to do with works today 
in this sermon. You know, some people have a works-based theology. They believe in that being very, very prominent. And others are on the other side, and they have an ultra-grace theology where they feel like, no, it doesn't matter. Anything goes. I've got that salvation. I've got that forgiveness. And then others think, well, you've got to work. You've got to do this. You've got to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And there's somewhere in the middle. I believe that there's grace, and I believe that there's truth. And we're going to look at the Word of God, and we're going to see what Ephesians tells us in Ephesians uh, 2, verse 8. They tell us that our works do matter. Um, verse 9 says Jesus was about both grace and he was about works as well. Let's look at this. It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And that's the English Standard Version. That's a very good translation of the Bible from, from Greek into the English language. And you notice how many times in there he talks about works, he talks about grace, he talks about the gifts of God, and that we are his workmanship. Each and every one of us were created by God to serve a purpose in this life, to do things to help advance his kingdom, to help advance his plan. And when we're doing what he's created us to do, we're walking fulfilled, and we're going to be sending those treasures on to heaven. We're going to be doing the things that we're going to reap rewards for on the other side in eternity. And it's so much more than the stuff that we accumulate on this earth because we can't take one suitcase even with us to heaven. We're not going to be able to take any pavement. We're not going to be able to take those things that are so valuable to us here to the other side in eternity. But we can send things ahead based upon our works and what we do on this earth. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 3, verses 5 through 15. I want you to count and see how many times you see the name or the word work or a form of works in this uh, scripture. After all, who is Apollos? Who is Paul? We're only God's servants through whom you believe the good news. Each of us did the work the Lord gave us. I planted the seed in your hearts, and Apollos watered it. But it was God who made it grow. It's not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What's important is that God makes the seed grow. The one who plants and the one who waters work together with the same purpose, and both will be rewarded for their own hard work. For we are both God's workers, and you are God's field. You are God's building. The cause of God's grace to me, I've laid the foundation like an expert builder. Now others are building on it, but whoever is building on this foundation must be very careful, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, Jesus Christ. Anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw. But on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. And if I counted correctly, there's about seven times that work is used in there or a form of work is used. And it's very interesting what Paul is talking about there. He's talking about the judgment seat of Christ. He's not talking about the great white throne judgment because as believers... In Christ, thank God, my sins were paid for on the cross of Calvary 2,000 years ago. The blood that was shed there paid for my past, present, and future sins. I wasn't, I wasn't even born 2,000 years ago, but that blood was there to pay for my mistakes, to pay for my sins. And I won't stand in judgment for my sins, thank God, but I will stand in judgment for my works. That's what he's talking about here. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved, still be saved, you'll have your salvation. But like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames, and that can make you think a little bit as a Christian. That's a little bit, a little bit scary there. You might smell a little bit like smoke when you come out of, that, out of that judgment if you don't have good works. And bad works are of the flesh. They're things that we do for our motives, for what we want instead of for what God has called us to do, what he's created us to do. What this word tells us that we should or should not do right here is our guide. And if we get away from this, that's when our stuff can be wood, hay, and stubble that we try to send ahead into heaven. So it's very important that we do biblical things, that we do what the Holy Spirit guides us to do, and that we're obedient. 
Uh, something I'm trying to, to teach on today, I found this article by Brad McCoy, and it's called Judged According to Our Works, and I think it's a, it's a pretty good descriptor of what I'm talking about today. So I'm going to read this to you also, and it says, No human works, efforts, or righteousness enter into the equation of God's saving grace. Uh, to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is reckoned as righteousness. That's Romans 4, verse 5. And Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, we've already covered. He talks about that. And uh, then he goes on to say, As a seminary student, there was an interesting little sign in the office of the registrar. This sign read simply, Salvation is by grace. Graduation is by works. That humorous message states a principle that is similar to a key axiom found in the Bible. Regeneration is by faith. Salvation is by faith. And evaluation is by works. Our works do matter. Regeneration, the impartation of eternal life, is a free gift to the sinner who trusts Jesus Christ as his personal Savior, is by faith apart from works. In contrast, and quite distinct from regeneration, every believer's Christian life will be subject to evaluation by Christ. This judgment for all the church-age believers will take place immediately after the rapture of the church at the Bema, or the judgment seat of Christ. The end uh, result of this evaluation of the believer's works will be bestowal or denial of special rewards, talking about how your works come through. Either they're going to survive the fire or they won't. It is important to note that this will not be a judgment to determine whether or not a person will live eternally with Christ. It will rather be in a saying of the equality of a believer's Christian experience. For the faithful Christian, it result in a special reward being given in proportion to the quality of his or, his or her works. If any man's works which he built on, upon it remain, he will receive a reward. If they're burned up, they suffer the loss of the rewards. But he himself shall be saved from hell, and uh, yet as though through fire. He says, notice that even in the worst case scenario, the believer who is denied any reward at all is still saved. The totally unfavorable evaluation does not jeopardize his possession of eternal life. He continues on, regeneration is by faith. Eternal life is by faith. And the reception of eternal rewards, rewards are by works. So it's a free gift. We have eternal life that is a free gift given to us based upon faith alone. And we're not called to serve God in order to gain, keep, or know that we have it. Instead, as those who are secure in their possession of eternal life, we ought to freely and faithfully respond to our gracious God, while at the same time realizing we do face a future evaluation of our lives before the Lord at the Bema Seat. Believers are not to walk with God because we fear that he is dangling us over hell and may drop us if we don't constantly measure up. Instead, we're to serve him out of gratitude for the free gift of eternal life he has given us and with sober realization that we will ultimately undergo a critical evaluation of our Christian experience. And the Bible continues on to tell us in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, verse 10, For we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil, we have done in this earthly body. And Revelation twenty two twelve 12 tells us, Look, I am coming soon, bringing my reward with me to repay all people according to their deeds. And that brings me to the second point today. Salvation is by faith, but our works determine what we receive in eternity. Yes, we're saved by faith. It's that grace. It's a free gift. It's given to us. But I'm saying all this today, trying to make you think, Christian, make you think just a little bit about where are you? What are you doing to serve the kingdom? You know, we are blessed here, you know, financially at the church. We have great givers. We have abundance in finances and resources. We can always use more because there's always more that we can do to go out to help the community. I'm not saying that, you know, if, if you, God lays it upon your heart to write a million-dollar check, please go ahead and do that. That's fine. That's not a problem. But I do ask you to listen to God. There's no amount that I'm going to tell you. There's no amount that Pastor Jeff's going to tell you. We ask you to ask the Holy Spirit, and in a moment, we're going to do that. We're going to bow our heads, and I'm going to ask you just to, just to get quiet and to listen. If you haven't already thought about it, if you haven't already brought your pledge in, but God does so much for us, why would we not want to do more for him? Why would we not want to pray and ask him and seek him and, and say, what can I do? Not just with financial resources. That's easy. The easy part's to write a check and put it in the offering plate or put a pledge amount on an envelope. But how am I serving? 
How am I making a difference in this church? How can we reach others? Can I greet at the front door? Can I shake somebody's hand? Can I help with the music? Can I help with the tech team? Can I videotape the service? Can I help with the children, the nursery? Are there things that you can do that God's laid upon your heart, that he's gifted you, that one day we're going to stand before him and we're going to be evaluated? Has anyone ever had an evaluation in here? I know I used to be in law enforcement and I would get evaluated by supervisors sometimes that you think, do they even know how to do the job that I'm doing at times? You know what I'm saying? It, it, it can be irritating, can it? It can be frustrating if you've got somebody who's not a fair uh, judge of what you're doing and your capabilities who are doing an evaluation of you. But someday, Christian, we're going to have the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords that's going to be evaluating what we've done in these earth suits for the 60, 70, if we're blessed, 80 or 90 years that we have on this planet. So that's what I'm trying to get you to think about today. What can we do to advance the kingdom of God? What can we do as a church to be the church, to do what this community needs, this, this area of Sevierville and the surrounding areas? How can we reach a lost and dying world? And maybe God's putting it upon your heart. And I just ask you to be obedient whatever it is that he's calling you and creating you to do. There's a quote that, uh, that I read when I was studying for this sermon. There's a Bishop Schnees, uh put it this way in his book, The Five Practices of Fruitful Living. We give because we are made in the image of God, whose essential nature is giving. We are created with God's nature imprinted on our souls. We are hardwired to be social, compassionate, connected, loving, and generous. God's extravagant generosity is part of our essential nature as well. But we are anxious and fearful, influenced by a culture that makes us believe we never have enough. And we are scared by habits that draw us away from God and turn us inward with a corrosive self-interest. God sent Jesus Christ to bring us back to ourselves and back to God. As we have in us the mind that was in Christ Jesus, we become free. And the problem with that is we're being influenced by culture. We're being influenced and bombarded by every commercial, by everything that we see on Facebook, on social media, on our smartphones. We're always wired into what's going on around us with technology. And unfortunately, the world is influencing us more than the church is influencing the world. And thus, we get back to what I was talking about earlier about revival. If we would seek God, if we would serve God, if we would use the resources that he's given us to advance the kingdom. And I'm not talking about a pastor telling you what to do. I'm talking about that personal relationship that we should have as believers with Jesus Christ where we spend that time in prayer. We spend that time seeking God, where we're praying, we're asking him, what should I do? What giftings do I have where we're trying to go out and advance the kingdom? That's what we should be doing. And I pray that we're doing that. And I know we do that here at Serval First. We try to impact our community in a positive way for Jesus. And we try to show them the love of Jesus Christ. And we'll continue to do that. But individually, is there somewhere that the Holy Spirit may be impressing upon you that I could do this? Maybe I'm not serving in a ministry in our church, but I can do this. And I'm going to step up and I'm going to make that decision. It might be more important than anything you might write on this card this morning. So whatever it is, just be obedient. John tells us in John chapter 3, he, he shows us exactly how giving our God is. Verse 16, we all know it. For God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God gave his best. He gave Jesus Christ to us. And why? So if we'll believe upon him, if we'll have faith in Christ, if we'll surrender our mind, will, and emotions to him, we'll not perish. We'll have eternal life. And that's the most important decision. If you've not made that today, that's something I'm going to ask you to pray about here in a moment. And then 2 Corinthians 8, it shows love to others, verse 24. To show them your love and prove to all the churches that are boasting about you as justified. Paul is talking to the church in Corinth there. He's talking about how he's been boasting about them and how they love. And they're going to show their love with giving. And that's going to prove their love. Because people don't really care how much you know until they know how much you care. So what did Jesus do? Jesus, he did this principle all the time. He would feed people. 
he would heal people. He would go and take care of their needs. And then he would tell them about the kingdom of God. He would tell them about his love and about eternal life. But three, giving shows love to a lost and dying world. And meeting needs gives us the opportunity to share that love of God with them. And that's your final point today. That's your final point. So who do you admire? I've got a, a strange question. I just wondered, do you admire anyone for keeping everything that they have, for hoarding, for being selfish? Is there somebody that you can think of in your mind that you admire for being a selfish person and they keep everything that they can, accumulate everything for themselves? You don't, do you? And not even the world does that. I mean, you can just look over here at this library, this little library just down the street from us here, the King Library there, King Family Library. The world even recognizes givers. They recognize people that are generous. They recognize people who use what's in their hand. You know, we did a study on Moses here recently. Moses said, "What? Well, I don't have much. And God says, what's in your hand, Moses? We all have something. I hope you don't have a staff that turns into a snake. If you do, I'd like to talk to you about that after. But that's a strange thing. But we all have some kind of resources. We have something that we can use to advance the kingdom of God. So I'm just going to ask you to do one thing for me. I want you to take your Bibles if you've got them. I want to take your notes. I want you to fold those up. If, you're, if you've got your, your notes in your Bible, put those out of the way. And I just want you to take the envelope and the pen. There should be one near your seat there. If you don't have one, we can get one to you. I just want you to take that, and I want you to look at the card. I want you to take the pen, and I just want you to bow your head. I want you to close your eyes, and I just want you to pray. I'm not going to tell you an amount to put on there that's between you and God that's, that's not up to me there's not a pastor that I know that's going to tell you what to put on there you've got that personal relationship with Christ he'll lay it upon your heart what you want to put on this card I just want you to pray get quiet be still and know that I'm God and you may say David why should I put anything on that card it's a good question. God gave you everything by giving Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. God gives you everything that you accumulate. He gave you the intelligence to go out, to get a college degree, to get a job. He gave you the favor. He gave you the ability. He gives you the paycheck. We're not the source. God is our source. Why else does it matter? It's faith. It's an act of faith. By putting an amount on this card, maybe you're going to say, God, I can't even do this amount, but I trust you that you're going to be able to make this happen, that I'll be able to bring this within the next year and give it. Why else do we want you to, to be givers and to be generous? It's not for us. It's not for the church. It's really for you. It's more blessed to give than to receive. And when we give, I don't believe you can personally outgive God. I've never been able to. When I give, even when I give an abundant gift, when I give something over and above the tithe, I've never outgiven Him. Missy and I and the kids, we've never gone without. We've never lacked. While you're praying and while you're listening, I want to ask you seven closing questions before you bring your pledge cards. Number one, are you willing to make changes in the way you use your resources as you listen to God's voice in your life? If God's spoken to you, if he's given you something through his spirit, are you willing to be obedient, even if you have to change the way you do business? Number two, what do you love about our church? Think about those things without your resources, without your serving, without your, your gifts. It'd be really hard for us to do ministry. There's not enough staff. Number three, how can you better support the church with your time, talents, and resources? Maybe it's not the check. Maybe it's not an amount that you're going to put on the card. But maybe you've been impressed today that, hey, I can be a greeter. I can be an usher. I could help that tech team back there. Maybe it's children's ministry, youth ministry. We've got a bunch of youth that are just incredible. 
Next question, can you love this church without supporting her? Think about that. You support those you love. If you have a family, if you have children, you, you support the ones you love. Number five, why should I pledge or give today? It's an act of worship for our God. That's why. Just as much as when we sing and we praise Him, when we give, that's worship. Number six, do you fear trusting God with your finances, with your time? Maybe this is a part of a faith step for you. Maybe you say, David, I just, I don't know where I'm going to pay the rent this month. Maybe you're going to show God that you trust him by being obedient to what he's asking you to do, not what a man's asking you to do. I'm not asking you to do anything but be obedient. And number seven, will you decide to step out in faith today and become a generous giver? Maybe even an extravagant giver. I'm going to ask everybody to stand. Every head still be bowed. Maybe you're here today and you say, David, I'm that person you were talking about. I've not made that decision for Jesus Christ. I don't know, God forbid, if I, if I died before tomorrow where I'd spend eternity. Well, today can be your day of salvation. Just pray a prayer like this. Say, Father God, I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sins. I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God, you raised him from the dead. From this day forward, I'll follow you, Jesus. I'll repent. I'll turn from my sins. And I ask you, Jesus, to save me. If you pray a prayer like that today, I just ask you to do one other thing. We're going to sing a few verses of a song in a moment. A lot of people are going to come forward. I'm going to bring our pledge in here that Missy and I have written, and I'm going to put it in the basket. And many people are going to walk this aisle in a moment. They're going to drop their pledges in. You don't have to walk the aisle. You can bring it into the church office. You can bring it after the service is over. You don't have to walk the aisle. But that's an act of faith and obedience to say, God, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to walk in front of others to let them see that obedience. But if you're here and you prayed the prayer for salvation, if you need prayer for any other reason, don't leave this house today without allowing me to pray for you. God bless you as we worship. My chains are cold. I've been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me. And my of love, His mercy Unending love, amazing grace. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy chains are gone I've been set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and my love blood His mercy reigns unending love amazing grace my chains are Thank you for that sweet worship. Let me pray for you and you guys will be dismissed. Father God, I just thank you for this opportunity, God, that we uh, come to worship you. That's the reason we're here today, to worship a risen Savior. And I just thank you for each and every person that was here today, God. They came out on a nasty Sunday morning. 
but they love you and they want to serve and worship you. God, I pray for the decisions that were made here today. God, I pray for each and every family that's represented. That, God, you would bless them abundantly to be a blessing to everyone they encounter physically, relationally, emotionally, spiritually, and financially this week. Let us go forward into the city of Sevierville and the surrounding areas showing the love of Jesus Christ and the good, good Father that we serve to everyone we encounter. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God bless you. Have a great Sunday.